So, uh, you know, a lot of groups, this is the basic problem that they're trying to, to face and solve is, is given a measurement, what are the underlying optical properties or characteristics of the tissue? And so I, what I wanted to stress here is that there are, it's here, but oh, it's not strong enough. Okay, so the problem span different scales, spatial scales. Uh, Giacomelli's group looked at for single scatterer size and shape. Uh, this is Sylvain Zhu looking at thicker tissues like fingers. Uh, and then, you know, there's groups, Brian Pogue's group is uh, devoted to looking at um, breast tissue and uh, creating diffuse optical tomography results. And so the computational models need to scale appropriately. You know, you've seen some, uh, you've had some experience with me scattering T-matrixes just to handle um, uh, ellipsoidal scatterers. Um, you've seen, had experience with the Monte Carlo. Uh, there are delta P1 and N, uh, PN approximations, and then the standard diffusion approximation. So I thought I'd put up another cartoon to create that's inverse related, inverse solving related, and to, uh, to create some levity in my talk, which I hopefully don't destroy soon. But um, the outline is that I hope to go over the chi-squared minimization. This is the chi-squared equation is the heart of an inverse solution. Uh, I'll go through the components of it. I'll go through some optimization methods. Um, I'll go through methods that don't require knowledge of the derivative and then those that do. Um, I'll go over an inverse solution that we performed using Monte Carlo. And then um, optical tomography, how those equations look. And then I'll do some examples in which we actually look at the chi-squared space in solving uh, two particular problems. So I think Rolf covered uh, this in his talk, so I'll go through it somewhat quickly, but you know, the forward problem is that you have some optical or physical parameters that uh, describe the tissue. You feed that into some sort of model function and you get your model measurement predictions. And the inverse problem is to take these measurements, use some sort of model, and predict your parameters. So this forward problem is very well posed, but the inverse problem can be ill-conditioned, and that is there could be many combinations of parameters that will invoke the same measurement. So um, this, the success of the inverse solution uh, relies on your appropriate choice of a model function, the parameters that you're trying to find, and the type and quality of your measurements. So here's the chi-squared minimization. Um, so the goal is to fit a model problem to adjustable parameters, and I've identified them as a vector A, to a set of measured data. So suppose you have M measurements, and I've uh, denoted them by Y hat here. You have M measurements with P parameters. So it's a vector A that has P components. And you want to find this vector, if it exists, that minimizes this function here. And notice that it's the difference between the measurements and Y is your um, model, prob model, model function um, divided by the standard deviation of the measurement. Uh, this creates a weighted chi-squared. You can see that if you have uh, a large uncertainty in one of the measurements, it will actually deweight the importance of that sum and to the overall sum here. Uh, if you don't have this information, then the function without the denominator is also equally used. So this function is derived from something called the maximum likelihood estimation. And there are two key assumptions about that derivation. The first one is that the measurements are mutually independent. And that 
Also, the measurements are normally distributed about a mean that is the model function. That's key. It's the mean that is the model function. So your model, uh, hopefully, is defining uh, a function that will give you back the measurements that you're, that you're trying to fit to. So I'll break down the components here. Here the equation is sitting up here. So the first thing is the measurements, y hat. You know, do you have as many measurements as unknown? Um, you possibly have seen that in, in uh, linear algebra classes or numerical methods classes in which you try to solve a system of equations. Um, are your measurements placed at locations or times that they're sensitive to the changes in A. So David earlier showed these great plots on SFDI and showed how when there's a change in mu A, where you're sensitive, and when there's a change to mu S, where the reflectance are sensitive. So, so you have to pick your measurements, in his case, the spatial frequencies, uh, so that you are able to pull out that mu A and mu S prime information. Is there redundancy in the measurements? Um, possibly you have more measurements than the unknowns, but some of the measurements are actually redundant and not giving you any additional information. And also David talked about, are the measurements calibrated? For the model function, uh, you want to make sure that the model function is accurate for the measurement domain. Um, standard diffusion, for example, has some uh, requirements that scattering is a lot greater than absorption and that you don't take measurements close to the source. So um, you want to pick your model function uh, that is sensitive to the changes that you're looking for. Can the model function provide predictions pretty quickly? You're going to use most likely in an inverse solution some sort of iterative method and each iteration, you're going to have that model function give you a forward prediction of uh, the new set of optical properties that you're, you're seeking. And so you have to be able to do that fairly quickly. Do the model predictions need to be integrated to match the measurements? Standard diffusion typically gives you an answer at a point, and maybe your detector is actually a surface region, and you might need to integrate that point solution over the surface of the detector. And if you do have this measurement error, uh, then it's nice to, to use it within this, this uh, weighted chi-squared. So the choice of your model function is based on your tissue type. So standard diffusion, there's a standard diffusion solution for homogeneous, layered, there, David Boas has one for an embedded sphere. Um, again, these have the assumption where mu s prime is much greater than uh, mu a. But if the tissue gets uh, pretty complicated, then, then there won't be a standard diffusion approximation. Um, if you decrease your spatial scale or you increase absorption, um, then uh, or you need angular information, then you need to use more higher order PN solvers. And then if things get really complicated in the tissue, then uh, Monte Carlo methods are, are pretty much the gold standard to use, although people also use things like finite element methods. So, and also these, we have these different uh, measurement domains that you've been seeing throughout the week. The source David talked about reflectance versus source detector separation or spatial frequency. Uh, tomorrow you'll hear more about uh, reflectance or transmittance uh, as a function of time or temporal frequency. And then if you're, uh, is it dependent on the wavelengths that you're using or any combination of the above. And then you also have to keep in consideration, are you looking for optical properties? Are you looking for chromophore concentrations? Are you looking for something smaller like scatter size or number density distribution of scatters? So all these things uh, play a part in your choice of the model function. So I'd like to go over a few optimization methods. 
um, and how they actually work in practice. The lookup table, simulated annealing, and the simplex method that you used in the integrating sphere require no knowledge of the derivative. Uh, and so I'll go over those first. And then the levenberg marquardt uh, uses that gradient information uh, in its inverse solution. So the way that the lookup table works is that you uh, find a range of, in, for instance, in David's case, he found a range of mu A and mu S prime values. And at each, uh, so it, within that range, uh, you create increments of each of the parameters. And then you generate, in his case, he used Monte Carlo to run forward predictions and get a uh, reflectance value for, in, uh, for each of the um, parameters. So um, once you generate, though, the nice thing about lookup tables is that once you generate it, it's done. You can use it over and over again. And um, so the time spent is just generating it. And, um, and so once, once you do, it's just like uh, David showed, you have your measurement here, say, at DC, and then fx equals 0.5. And then you interpolate into this lookup table and find the mu A and mu S prime that gave rise to, to, that, to those measurements. Um, one of the key assumptions, though, is that you need a unique solution. You need an, a unique um, set of optical properties that map, or I should say this, for each set of measurements, you have a unique set of optical properties that map to it. So it's really easy to implement. And I wanted to show some of these maps that were actually uh, working with, with Darren's uh, Roblier's group in Boston University. Um, his lookup table, this is showing for RD equals 0, uh, FX equals 0, the, D, the DC, and then FX equals 0.3 here. And these blue lines are constant mu S primes, and the black lines are constant mu A. And so in this combination of spatial frequencies, you can see that there's this orthogonality, which is nice. That you'll be able to pull apart those uh, different parameters using this particular lookup table. But over here, I show where fx equals 0.2 and fx equals 0.3, so closer. You can see how it's really kind of laying on top of itself. If you had uh, you know, two diffuse reflectance measurements down in this range, you really wouldn't be able to know what the optical properties separated out to. So um, the next method that doesn't need derivative information is called simulated annealing. And um, you start with an initial guess of your parameters. And then you take a step, so you update these parameters based on something called a current temperature. The simulated annealing was taken from kind of a metal, metal process in which they cool down, um, cool down the metal. And what you do, so this, there's a schedule of temperature cool downs. And these are all set a priori. And there's examples of good choices for those um, to initially try. Um, and so you, you base your update to these parameters based on this current they call it temperature. And if you move to a, a location where a chi-squared is smaller, then, then good, you accept it. But then if you don't, say chi-squared is bigger, then you actually accept it sometimes due to this function, uh, which they, they, people, some people call the metropolis criterion. And it's kind of like you're bad sometimes. You know, you don't always go smaller in chi-squared. So once in a while, you, you um, take, a, take an update to, uh, to A, accept this delta A, if chi-squared got bigger. And then after you've moved around a bit in, in the chi-squared space, do these updates, then you 
then you change this temperature and you reduce it and you do this algorithm again. So the concept is that you go downhill in chi-squared space, minimizing chi-squared space most of the time, but then periodically you bubble up and, and, and move to a place of, of increased chi-squared. What this allows you to do is to get out of local minima. So, so this guy is coming down, he's reducing his chi-squared, but then he decides, okay, I'm gonna take this and increase my chi-squared. Ah, let me describe what this is a picture of. Um, this is a picture of a chi-squared uh, map, a, a cartoon of one, a schematic of one, and not, not a real one yet. And you have your parameter A here, you have your parameter A2 here, A1 here, A2 here. And these regions are showing um, uh, regions of constant chi-squared. And I've tried to indicate here that blue is, is higher in elevation and then down, this is your global uh, minimum that you're looking for. But you could, in this chi-squared map, have one or more uh, local minima. And many times, um, methods get stuck in those. And so you converge to values of your parameters um, in your algorithm, but they're not the, the right parameters that will actually minimize and, and match your measurements the best. But the pitfall of this method is that you have to make sure that your cooldown schedule is slow enough that um, you know you can actually kind of get out of these, de depending on the terrain of your chi-squared um, domain, you, that, you, that you cool down slow enough, but then you don't go too fast, so you jump over things. Any questions so far? Okay, so I'm going to cover this, this method, the simplex method, because this is actually what was underneath the hood in the uh, integrating sphere problem that you were working on yesterday. And um, the way this works is, is that you, you um, set up an initial set of um, optical property vertices. In this case, I show a, a triangle, but this can be used in higher order uh, geometric shapes as well. So you start off with an initial mu A1, mu S1, mu A2, mu S2, and, and form uh, the set of vertices. And then you determine your chi-squared value at each of these and you order them. So this guy is your highest chi-squared, this is your lowest. And so you want to get rid of the one with the highest and update it. So, so say V3 was your highest, then you would want to get move, create a triangle which gets rid of this and moves it someplace else, but retains these two. So you find the center of gravity between these two, and then there's different uh, actions that you can do where you reflect the triangle, you contract it, you expand it, and then you reduce, there's a method in which you reduce the whole side down. And this, this moves the triangle around in phase space, and this algorithm is looking to get rid of that highest chi-squared and move it to a location where the new triangle has a new ordering and that, that chi-squared has been reduced in the overall triangle. <coughs> So yeah, like I said, if you had more um, uh, parameters, you could use higher spaces. There's typical values of these reflections. I kind of show them here now where you reflect, you contract here, you expand, all in search of finding, kind of going towards this minima here. Um, and let me show you a little animation here. So this is showing how that triangle is moving around chi-squared space and finding that minima. This method is sometimes called amoeba because it kind of looks like amoeba morphing and moving around.
so one of the problems that this has is that you can actually stop the algorithm but still have differential information. The grading could be actually greater than zero, and but the algorithm stopped. Um, it's just the nature of the method. Um, and also, if you start with a too small triangle, you could like be just moving around really close locally and, and uh, uh, get stuck. But as you saw, hopefully, it's pretty successful in determining optical properties, especially in the integrating sphere um, application. OK, now I'll move on to derivative-based methods. And you guys have maybe seen the newton raphson method, if you took a numerical methods class in which you're trying to find the zeros of a function. You look at an in initial x value. You determine the function. You find the derivative at that, at that value. You find where it intersects the x-axis. That's your update. And you continue this until you find the zeros of this function. So the way that you would do this, if you see a1 is determined by a0 and this function. But generally, you would find a n plus 1 equals a n minus the function evaluated at a n divided by its derivative at a n. So in our case, we want to minimize the gradient of the chi-squared. So here's the gradient of the chi-squared. This is um, taking the derivative, the first derivative of chi-squared, that's what it's meant to be, of, with respect to each of these parameters, parameters. And this is just straightforward differentiation. If you remember the chi-squared has squared term, bring it in forward, take the derivative, there's a minus sign, and this is your gradient. So in order to solve this using newton raphson is that we need the derivative of the gradient, which is something called the Hessian. You can see here that this is the second derivative. Along the di diagonal is the second derivative with respect to each of the parameters. And then off diagonal, you have the second derivative cross terms. So it looks something like, something like this. And again, it's just direct differentiation uh, of the chi-squared with respect to these different parameters. So if we were to write this method in matrix form, it would be this vector a at step n plus 1 would be a at n. And, and in matrix form, this f divided by f derivative becomes Hessian inverse times the gradient. So the levenberg marquardt uh, uses this, this, the concept of the newton raphson method, but adds a twist to it. So just to um, rearrange terms, I just took, and I'll show an expansion of this, I just made it into an ax equals b, where your a equals one half the Hessian, your b here is minus one half the gradient, and delta a is what you're looking for. So I just rewrote that in a, in a form that we see a lot, ax equals b. And the way that levenberg marquardt works is that this A matrix, it takes the diagonal elements and adds a factor, multiplies against a, a, with a factor 1 plus lambda. Lambda is a positive value. So kind of expanding what that looks like. So this is your ax equal b with your Hessian here, you have your diagonal elements with 1 plus lambda. Here's your unknown, and here's your right-hand side. And so the algorithm is, and I've actually used these values, with uh, you take an initial guess of A, and you compute your chi-squared. Then you use a lambda of 0.001. And you, and you determine what your delta A is. So you invert that matrix, you try to determine what delta A is, and you evaluate what your new chi-squared is. If the new chi-squared is greater than what your current chi-squared is, then you hit that lambda by a factor of 10. And you do this again until you get one in which the chi-squared, you've actually found a smaller chi-squared, and then and then you um, reduce your lambda and you update your, 
your A with your, this delta A. What you're doing is you're hitting that matrix that you're trying to invert, the Hessian, with this diagonal element. And if you kind of think, so it's one plus lambda, lambda's growing. You're creating this diagonally dominant matrix. And if you kind of think of it in the limit, it's kind of like identity matrix. You're pushing it to a, a way that's going to be invertible. It's easier to invert. It's making the importance of that diagonal more important than the cross terms. And so that's why it's a combination of the steepest descent. The steepest descent is actually going along the, the diagonal elements directions. And as you get closer to the minima, it's actually starting to involve the off diagonal. In other words, this lambda starts sh shrinking as you get closer and um, you'll, you'll uh, and that's called the inverse Hessian method. So it's a nice, um, nice uh, combination of methods and I've used this over and over again with these particular values and had good success with it. So one of the problems though is that it could converge to a local minima. Um, it has no, it's always going to lower chi-squared. So, um, and once it, it can't get any lower, it stops. Um, and so one way that we've mitigated that, whoops, in Vossen's lab is that you can start uh, randomly selected initial guesses all around um, your, your parameter range of interest and then see where the majority, I think we took 10 initial guesses and then we saw where the majority of those, and that way you know that the particular initial guess that you chose, um, if it found a local minima, well, other ones will find the one that you need to identify those parameters. So any questions about that so far? Has everyone used any of these in their work? Yeah? A little bit? Well, you guys did, technically yesterday, you did the simplex method. Um, okay. Uh, I'm going to re review using Monte Carlo to run an inverse solution. And one of the benefits of Monte Carlo is that you can use very small source detector separations. You don't have to worry about mu A uh, being much less than mu S. Um, and also it can handle any tissue geometry. Um, so the beauty of Monte Carlo is that it's going to give you, you know, the gold standard forward predictor. But the problem is, is that Monte Carlo typically has not been used in an inverse solution because you'd have to run another simulation when you up update A with delta A. So um, the inverse um, optimization routine would be sitting there going, okay, we'll run another Monte Carlo, wait an hour, update, run another Monte Carlo, wait an hour, update. So perturbation Monte Carlo was the method that we came up with to figure out how to generate those forward predictions very quickly using a background, a simulation that's already run. And so I described that on Tuesday about how you actually perform that. Um, but I'll kind of redefine things in terms of uh, inverse problem where we're looking, so we have a model, this is our I, but it's our model problem, model function here based on parameters here. And we use an estimator um, and this estimator is evaluated using a measure based on the baseline set of random walks. And, um, and say we're looking for a perturbed set of, of parameters. Well, one way we could estimate what the model forward prediction of that new set of parameters is that we run actually a simulation in which we change those optical properties, but instead we use the background random walks and apply this radon nicotine that I described on Tuesday factor, and that is done a lot quicker than running an sim independent simulation. So it's faster, better correlation, like I said on Tuesday, so that's better. You're actually capturing that change rather than the stochastic nature of an independent simulation. 
We can differentiate it so we can use it in a gradient-based optimization. And just to keep in mind, you could have a very heterogeneous tissue. You could use this to look at parameters in any one of those regions. Um, but the disadvantage is, is that it's a perturbative method. So it works best if the perturbations are small because you're applying this weight factor. The weight factor, this weight factor can get, as you, as you can see, it's the ratio of two things in which these are, this delta A could create a numerator that's a lot bigger than the denominator or, or a lot smaller and uh, the weight factors could get unwieldy and create large error. But we had good success in using it within a layered cervical tissue to identify the optical properties of the top and layer, top and bottom layer. Uh, and we found that we could perturb mu a about by a factor of three or divided by three, and then mu s with plus or minus about 30%. And I just want to point out that if you wanted to play around with this, the MATLAB interwrap um, file has uh, part of the download, uh, has an example of how you would run this. So here's just a little schematic of how the inverse ru runs. You have already run your background random walks, and they're stored. You take an initial guess, you use these, these random walks in the database to get your forward prediction. You compare it using chi-squared with your measured data, figure out what chi-squared is. Did it converge? No. Then you use your differential information to update um, what your new step is, delta A, and then continue. And you usually stop when either chi-squared changing is below some epsilon or that your, your predictions of delta A are below some epsilon. So if there's no question, any questions? Okay. So that perturbation-based model, the stuff you showed previously in the week was like a small region being changed in optical properties. Yeah. you're doing this, are you optimizing locality as well as the absorption properties? I, in, in the example that I, in the data that... Can you repeat the question? Oh, sure. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I'll let him... Okay. okay. I was just asking uh, what you were optimizing for in the perturbation-based model. Uh, yeah, so in, in this particular example that I gave, we, it was a layered system. We knew, we assumed we knew where that layer was. I think that's what you might be asking for. And we found the optical properties in the top and bottom layer. Yeah, but um, we have not yet, although we were working on trying to add in variability in that layer thickness too. Uh, and trying to use that as another parameter to fit. Yeah. But you can also, it, we have, so we had two regions here. You can have n regions, and, and conceptually, the process should work. OK. Here's another question. Oh. Thanks. So you said that this works best for small perturbations. Yeah. But like for, what you've been working on, like how how small of a perturbation can you do? Like you know, what what kind of stability do you get, and uh, how quickly uh, do, does this drop off to where like you know a perturbation of a given size you can't use it anymore? Yeah. Okay. Well, two parts to that question. The first thing is when I say uh, it has to be small, I mean in a probability sense. So it has to be small not only in the change in the optical properties of these uh, regions, perturbed regions. Mm -hmm. So the magnitude of the optical property change as well as the geometric change because the amount of scattering uh, and path lengths that are in here are playing a part in those weights. And those are the things that are getting unwieldy. And the second part of your question is a harder one because it, it depends a lot on your uh, what you're solving for and, and the tissue optical properties. I just gave those an ex as an example of the uh, optical properties I was using and, and that's why I spelled out exactly all the optical properties because um, actually Jennifer, who's a student of Vasan and Jerry, is currently looking to find the size of scatterers 
a three distribution log normal scatterer uh, tissue definition and she's looking for the radius of each of the three distributions, average radius and also the number density. And what, what her, her ability to perturb is going to be quite different uh, due to the nature of her problem and the number of scattering events that are occurring and, um, and that sort of thing. So yeah, I think it's hard to come up with a universal uh, statement about that. Right. Thank you. Yeah, just, just an additional comment about that point. Uh, so you're looking at perturbations that are small, and you have to ask, compared with what? And the answer is compared with two independent runs of the forward problem. If you look at the difference of the independent problem runs, you'll get some information about the perturbation but the relative error will be much larger because there's no correlation coming from the perturbation analysis. So that's a consideration. Um, and you can show, and in Carol's thesis she did show, that uh, you can gain a very lot, a very large amount of efficiency by looking at PMC instead of by looking at independent runs. So I think that's the quantitative yes. take on it. Yeah. Thanks, Jerry. Let me just comment uh, from a slightly different angle, from a more practical angle. So a lot of the initial application of perturbation Monte Carlo, at least in our group, was to look at layered systems because um, we're there's a lot of interest in looking at superficial tissue layers because cancer is obviously a problem that happens in very thin layers and that um, you know, typical analytical models don't work well in that domain. So we've done a lot of work in layered tissue models where the superficial layer is less than a transport mean free path. And, and typically um, this type of ranges of perturbations we're able to get reasonable agreement with the forward and inverse problem are actually uh, fairly broad, you know, so if you're in a regime where there's ratio of scattering to absorption is large, you know, on the order of tens to hundreds, you can perturb the absorption coefficient in a superficial layer anywhere from a third to 300% of the baseline and still get, you know, still get reasonable recovery. And scattering, there's, a, uh, there's more stringency there. You could probably go down to about 70% of scattering up to 130%. So that again is in this very limited context where you have all of your perturbation in a thin superficial layer. But I wanted to give some numbers just in that context. So even though the optical property, and it's, yeah. I think because that layer is so thin, you can actually have a fair bit of tunability in optical properties. But as you make that perturbation geometrically larger, uh, I bet you the range of optical properties that you can perturb gets smaller. Actually, for this paper, we found the top and bottom layer optical properties with this fidelity. Yeah, so the bottom layer is quite thick. Yeah. Okay, I'll move on to optical tomography. Um, this is a picture from Brian Pogue's group, and maybe you, somebody, some of you in Brian Pogue's group work with this device, but um, this is a, a device to measure breasts, uh, and there are 16 sources in this array and 16 detectors, and um, so there's 250 measurements that surround the breast here. And what these guys, the tomography, we're actually not only looking for optical properties, but the location of those. So it's a, they want a 3D map of, of the tissue. And I just show some results here. This is actually on a synthetic breast and where they knew the true distribution of optical properties. And this is the reconstruction of where those uh, changes occurred and what they were and the values. So things get complicated fast here. So now our chi-squared 
has this additional sum and uh, in which we're trying to minimize the specter A now with S sources and M measurements. So this S times M total measurements. But, you know, a lot of times the, so you segment the tissue into regions in which you're going to try to find the optical properties. And the number of regions far outnumber the number of measurements that you have. I mean, so he had about 256 measurements here, but they worked on systems in which they segmented that breast into thousands of, of um, tissue regions. And so, so this is a very underdetermined system, and which means that it's ill-posed and some regularization techniques are applied. So just to write this in matrix uh, notation, I've written it here where capital Y uh, represents the measurements and model predictions or capital uh, Y hat and Y just to get it into matrix notation. So this is uh, complicated. So they, the first thing they do is just set a linearization. They take the kind of Taylor expansion of this thing and they set the first derivative to zero just to simply get, simplify the equation here. And J here is the Jacobian matrix, um, which is the derivative of the model at all detectors. And um, so this Jacobian has this kind of dimension. So if you were solve for A, delta A in this equation, you get something that looks like this. Again, we're going to have to take the inverse of a matrix here. It's a Jacobian transform to Jacobian. And so what they do is they do this Tikhonov regularization. Again, we're adding this um, lambda factor to the diagonal. So this is identity matrix. We're adding this lambda factor to the diagonal, and that's going to hopefully help us invert this thing, because this is going to be a huge problem. Um, and this lambda, though, uh, people have used a scalar, one value along the diagonal. They have used um, a lambda that is a function of the tissue segments. That's actually, I think, what Brian Pogue's group does. Um, and uh, but but they have found a lambda in order to invert this and 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 get that 3D spatial map of optical properties. And a lot of times um, they use a Levenberg Marquat to do this. I I point to Pogue's paper here because he he gives you the details more details on this if you wanted to see more of the intermediate steps. So I thought that I'd show real examples, well, semi-real in the virtual world, uh, how we look at chi-squared spa chi space for a particular problem and how it looks based on the type of measurements, the location, if you add noise to your measurements, and if your initial guess is different. And in all the, I just do two cases, two test cases, and we use the levenberg marquardt in the inversion. So the first case that I look for, looked at is reflectance versus rho. So we have a tissue, we have a source, we have six detectors on the surface, and we're looking for mu a and mu s prime. So I simulate my measured. Uh, and I use this NURBS. This is the closest thing that we have uh, on the GUI uh, to reality um, because it's a Monte Carlo-based solution. So I simulated my measurements with this uh, scaled Monte Carlo with NURBS. But then for my model, I used SDA. And note that I used detectors in this range, 0.1 to 0.6 millimeters. Um, my measured values for mu A and mu S prime, so I know these. These are 0.01 inverse millimeters and 1 inverse millimeters. Um, these are the, the values I'm going to see how well I do with this particular model. And, um, and so I'll, I'll run the inversion. And here's what 
the actual chi-squared map looks like. This is on the left-hand side. This is the row values that I looked at. Here's, so the measured data is shown, the simulated measured data are the blue dots. The initial guess is the, are the red dots with a line. And then what the algorithm converged to are the green dots, and then I put a line through that. So you can kind of see how it's not really going through the measured very well here. Um, and likewise, in the, in the uh, chi-squared space, you see these. So here's your mu a, mu s prime. These show equal chi-square values. This shows the initial guess and how it tries to get to this minima or the path it takes. And note that you could take uh, different, you know, different initial guesses starting in different places. You would enter this basin differently. But see how, how badly it did. It, it, it's it's a, getting mu a with this kind of error and mu s prime with this kind of error. So does anyone have an idea of what's wrong with this problem? Remember that. Remember that I'm using SDA. I'm using SDA, but I've got my source detector separations fairly small. And that's, that's a problem using SDA. And this is showing, this is showing the, the results. Actually, the measured, if, the measured value in this chi-squared space is actually right here. It's not. So that tells you something too. The measured value is not even in this basin here. So, so, so there's a there's a skewedness between what you're trying to uh, your the measurements that you're trying to fit and the model's ability to predict that to predict that. So this is one of the cases where the um, mean of the model function or the is is not um, you know is is not. Um, centered at the measured data. So model is not matching that. So let's move the detectors out and see what happens. Because standard diffusion does well in many problems, as long as you can make sure that the, the light field is isotropic by the time that you're detecting it. So I move them out instead of from 0.1 to 0.6 from to 1, still keep the number of 6 one, two, three, four, five, six is the detectors. And now you can see better, better um, uh, inverse solution here. I again show the measured data in blue. You can now see the converged green value going through them a lot nicer. You can see that the uh, measured data is, is sitting better into this basin, although not perfectly because standard diffusion still has some deficits, but it's identifying the optical properties pretty good. So it's definitely improved. So this is just an example of where you want to make sure your model is matching what you're trying to fit. And then I added some noise uh, to the measurements. I, I added 5% noise just to show how, how this path in can vary. And I tried another initial guess, and it shows how the path in comes in and how the change to the optical property. A lot of times you get the same, even if you try another initial guess, you go right into the same value. <laughs> and here shows another one where same value, you converge the same value, but look at the path it took. It's like going here, 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 here. It finally gets in there but it gets there. Okay, so I thought that I'd show an example with spatial frequency because that's what David talked about this morning. And um, so, but now we're going to look for chromophore concentrations. We're going to look for HB, HBO2. A and B are the, the coefficients of the scattering function. A, A lambda to the minus B. And so I chose two spatial frequencies, 0.2 and 0.3. There were eight wavelengths equispaced in this range. I again used simulated measurements with NURBS. I used NURBS as my model function. Okay, this is called the inverse crime. 
because you're kind of fooling yourself, like I'm going to use my model as my measurements. Well, that's, that's just called the inverse crime. It's something you should not do. What's that? I guess so. I guess so. If your model's good, it's, it's, it's good. So, so I'm looking for these guys. Um, just for knowledge, I, I took for my measured, I took the tissue type skin and the spectral panel from our GUI, and I used these values and the scatterer law. So these are the values from this spectral panel that I used as my simulated measured data, and those are the values I'm looking for, I'm seeking. And just to break this down for you, so you're looking for chromophore concentrations and the, the parameters A and B in the scattering function here. And the only difference is that there's just kind of an added step in what we call the model function here. So we convert these to spectra for mu A and mu S prime, and then we feed those into the um, model function and get our predictions here for reflectance versus uh, spatial frequency and wavelength. And I just chose HB and HBO2, but you know, anything you have spectra for, you can, can do this, do similar setup. So let's look at this. So spatial frequencies, absolutely no noise. We have absolutely no error. I found, found those parameters, HB and HBO2, perfectly. So here's my initial guess. I came in, I found them exactly, zero error. You know, they, the converged values go right through the measured here. Perfect. Okay, but this is the inverse crime. So this is, this is actually the first step whenever we're trying out a new model. We do the inverse crime. Just because if you don't get the recovery in the inverse crime as your first step, you're in trouble. Then the next step, you can use a more, a different uh, measured data and then hopefully you go to measurements on a phantom, then you go measurements on a human. So there's a progression to test out your model. Okay, but now let's do the inverse crime, but let's add 2% noise to the measured data. Okay, now my HBA and HBO2 aren't looking so good. Um, yeah, things aren't. It degraded pretty fast with just 2% noise. But the A and B are doing pretty good. Um, any anyone have an idea of why the scattering is being found easier or better than the, than the absorption? If you remember David's plot, oh. I was saying, so you're just your spatial frequencies of 0.2 and, 0 .2 and 0 0.3 inverse millimeters, then you're really going to have a hard time separating absorption and scattering at that wavelength, but scattering does affect the diffuse reflectance curve. Yeah. David showed a curve this morning in which um, he had the spatial frequencies here. Spatial frequencies here, yeah. And he had RD here. And he showed for changes in absorption, something kind of looks like this. This is, I'm not doing it very well, 0.2 and 0.3. Here's zero. Um, but yeah, so there's, there's differentiation with, but they all kind of, out here, there's no sensitivity to those two spatial frequencies for absorption. So that's the problem that's that's happening here. So, so reflectance is essentially a function of one variable Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, you need you need path length for absorption, right? So so that's another way of looking at it. So at those those higher spatial frequencies, you're you're not getting the path lengths in the tissue enough to get that absorption. Carol, can you also see it from the lookup table that you showed earlier? Remember you had two lookup tables? I, yeah. You don't necessarily need to bring but up But I'm the, not using the lookup table. I know you aren't, oh, okay. but what I'm saying is that the lookup table intrinsically shows you that once you have the two spatial frequencies close to each other, all of those 
curves kind of collapse on top of each other. And so a small error in your measurement will g translate into a large error yeah. into your recovered optical yeah, progress. Yes. Yeah, yeah you don't need to go back oh, to don't. that chart. But well, here, 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 here. Yeah. Oh, I found it, it though. Yeah, I'm you here. had it. There yeah, you you're talking about the right one. these are exactly the spatial frequencies I'm using, yeah. 0.2 and uh, 0.3, albeit for, um, yeah, okay, and yeah, definitely, that grid is just not orthogonal at right. all. But the spacing and scattering is actually still there. So you see uh, the, the, the scattering isocurves are actually well separated, the but blue. the absorption curves are the ones that get compressed. I see, okay. And so that's exactly why you get good recovery and scattering, but not absorption. Okay, thanks, Vasa. So what would be the case if the spatial frequencies are very far away from each other, like a 0 and a 0.5? And 0.5. Well, I'll, okay, We're, I'll bring up an example uh, that's related to your, top, to your question uh, that's coming next, okay. but it actually doesn't use um, 0.5, it uses 0 and I think 0.3. Um, David might be able to give you it, uh, information about using 0 and 0.5. Um, okay. It's kind of slow. Okay. Here. Unless you're aware. Okay. So 2% noise. Okay. okay. Okay, so now we change our spatial frequency to, let's see if this answers, and if not, we'll keep on going with it, uh, from 0 to 0 and 0.2 instead of 0.2 and 0.3. But add in the 2% noise. And here you can see now we're, we're getting absorption a lot better. This is a view from the chi-squared map case where your initial guess and how you come in here. So we're definitely getting absorption better. And I think, I think the DC is actually what's helping with, with that absorption. And then here are your our scattering values. And again, they're, they're looking good too. Did that answer? Did that answer, or would you like to know? So, so if we were to run a, Dave, Dave is saying that if if we were to have tried zero and 0.5, we might expect similar recovery of the optical properties. I guess there's no added benefit or change between 0 0.2 and, and 0.5. If they're slightly faster, fewer iterations. Thanks. Um. I may be remembering this incorrectly, but I think there is a paper last year from Darren Robler's group showing that, uh, I think with Monte Carlo simulations, their lookup table for DC and 0 0.5 showed that it was already starting to uh, collapse a little bit between MUA and MUS prime, but only for like certain combinations of optical properties. I see. Yeah, you can see that it was 0 and 0.3, I think, that you had up there, you kind of see the two corners. Yeah, there's a little curvature. Yeah. It's not like like right angles everywhere. There's like at the edges, there's a little folding. When your UA and US prime start to get to be very similar in value, then you get curves that look flat, slight, slowly roll up. Uh, when uh, mu A and mu US prime are close in value, you get kind of these flatter curves that slowly roll off that look very similar, whether it's absorption or scattering contrast. So that's when you start to have trouble. Yes. I see, yeah. <laughs> so, in summary, I hope that. Uh, oh, sure. So, because I think this is a, a potentially a very practical problem, especially when you're doing multispectral measurements. And so, obviously, we're just focusing on inverse problems primarily where you're like looking at optical properties at individual wavelengths. And we had this discussion offline, I think during the break, where spectral measurements and a, and a, a priori assumption of the, of say, the, the structure of the scattering function as a function of wavelength can then inform, uh, can inform this inverse problem. So going back uh, to what David just said, that intrinsically there seems to be a lack of uh, the ability of the, um, 
of the spatial frequency domain at two large, uh, different spatial frequencies to separate absorption from scattering. And absorption and scattering are comparable. If you're taking measurements on multiple wavelengths and you have part of your data set where you do have a greater mismatch between absorption and scattering, can you then apply that information at a different wavelength to kind of condition or add information to the wavelengths at which they're more comparable to still kind of tease the two out. David, could you comment potentially? I'm putting you on the spot, but just uh, sure. curious. I, I can try. I think I think what you said is right. Uh, you know, when you, like a melanin is a very strong absorber, and the visible uh, blood can absorb light very strongly. Um, in those regimes, we don't have very much to gain from adding SFDI because it's not going to sh reveal very much of the contrast between absorption and scattering. Um, on the flip side, making sense of reflectance in the near infrared, um, is, it's very hard to get to absorption information unless you know the path length really, really well. So we kind of have a hybrid approach that we use you know, diffuse reflectance, a planar reflectance across the large spectrum, but we use uh, red or infrared SFDI to decouple absorption and scattering, and then I have a wavelength dependent model. So it's kind of best of both worlds. We use some spectral contrast coming from the known a priori features of the spectra, um, and then we use the SFDI to give us that path length estimate. Um, and then later on top of that, we have you know the ability to co correct for uh, packing fraction, which is another a big problem in the visible when you have a, a large amount of the absorption occurring from a small volume fraction of the tissue. It has its own spectral effect. Okay, just in summary, uh, I hope that you've seen that you, um, you know, you, you hope to choose your measurement that is sensitive to your parameters of interest, select your model that is valid for the measurement type, I gave you an example of how you could actually use Monte Carlo in an inverse solution, and um, different optimizations that are actually used in the biomedical opt optics field right now, and if you wanted to um, do a little chi-squared exploration of your own. Um, everything that I did, I just started with the VTS solver demo in our MATLAB download, and I just tweaked it for the particular test case I was looking at. So thanks. Any last questions? Well, I'm around. Oh. OK. Oh, David. Yeah. Carol, that was awesome. I always learn a few new things every time uh, I hear this this talk. So, thank you. <coughs> um, I love your chi squared maps. They always remind me that while we often live behind, you know, this MATLAB command line interface of just tell it to follow, find the solution, then you pick your your favorite, you know. Um, fitting method, that under the hood there's, it's just these topology maps that, you know, every pixel on the x and y axis just represents some combination of those independent variables. And, you know, if you were to just plot this out, you don't necessarily need a mathematical algorithm. You can use your eyeballs to find the, the, the solution. True. Um, I'm not sure if I have a good question, um, but sort of a gadfly kind of question. It, in how many how many of these approaches um, are historical because computing was expensive and you had to make a small number of computations to get to the solution versus you know you, computing this chi squared map is for visualization for all, all of us to see but normally you don't compute the whole map right right you just compute the values at these individual points but now that we have you know computers in the sky and and GPUs that can do a billion things in parallel like, how does that apply? Which of the methods, or all of them, or some of them, are are no longer as useful? Or if you were just to do brute force, so you just compute every single possible combination of the independent variables, you know, either store or compute on the fly the the objective value, subtract it from your data, and see what you have. And yeah. if, if not, move on to the next one and just, or just, just keep going. Or just create this whole map. 
create just, the whole map. Just grid out, just, just create ranges for your parameters of interest. Yeah. And then do and rep then just, maps, and, you know, re re replicate your data uh, into this matrix and subtract the yeah, two things yeah, and just yeah. and make find where it's zero. I mean, basically small. that's what I did to do this. Right. Um, and you're right. It's a very good point that you bring up in, in that now that we have, like when I made the comment about using Monte Carlo in an inverse solution, you know, these days, you could just put the solution out to a, a set of GPUs and get it back in an instance. So, so why not do that instead of uh, PMC, although there's lots of correlation there. But in this particular case where, um, yeah, you, you could do that. And, you know, it's, it's, I have not found anyone in the literature has actually taken advantage of that and generated their solution that way. But, um, yeah, with with uh, if you had all if, if you could do this generate this map in an instant, then wouldn't that change how you and you would just go through that map and just digitally find okay give me the lost smallest value then you know and then map it back to the two parameters that that generated that then you'd know your inverse solution. So yeah. I I can't I can't think of a reason why that wouldn't work if you could uh, with latest computers do that. Mm -hmm. um, Unless you don't know the range uh, appropriately, like um, you know, we we I so in this kind in this map, I assumed B was in this range, mm -hmm. and so it wouldn't find anything outside that range. Yeah, you know, so you'd have to make sure you made it big enough to encompass any possible. Sure. Um, so that what you what you evaluate is not a local minima, for instance. Yeah. Yeah. So it could work for some problems. I, I see, you know, we fight up against this in my work, too. What you're showing here is um, a cross-section of a multi-dimensional chi-squared space, right? Right. You have just A and B, but you right. have other parameters that are also being used simultaneously. HB and HBO, too. So, yeah, I just did a slice of the chi-square with respect to these parameters. But, yeah, you could so, do four-parameter. But as the number of variables increases more and more, uh, you might geometrically get outside of you know what would be practically stored or, mm -hmm. or computed. Mm -hmm. uh, well, just that's a, an just interesting a point. Oh. Okay. Just one other comment about that. Um, you know, this is a really nice chi-square space. You know, it, this has like very uh, little structure to it, and it's very simple. But like in kind of in the abstract and unknown case, you might like miss a lot of structure if you want to brute force everything depending on the the size of your interval where you're checking different values, right? Because every time we use a computer, we're still looking at discrete values rather than, you know, an actual continuous thing. So if we do have something that has a lot of structure, especially in a high dimensional space, then we need to check a lot of values. And so creating a lookup table would be a pretty, or maybe pretty expensive, both in terms of computation and in terms of memory for storing all this. So just, just my, my own little gadfly comment there. <laughs> I think we have another. Um, the problem that uh, Carol referred to before uh, that Jennifer's working on is a very complicated problem. Um, and the collaborator in Los Alamos has us working on it because she would like to create a one-stop clinical protocol for cervical cancer. The problem with the current screening is that you have to come back and many of the patients don't come back for further follow-up. So if, she, if she's looking for a real-time inverse solution, now here's a case where you have a large population of individuals that present even a greater dilemma in trying to map the space from a forward uh, lookup table because the range is bigger, much bigger. So you may find that um, the PMC method has a very large advantage in that case, and we're hoping it does. <laughs> Other questions?
let me just pose another idea. Um, I, I think that once one has a, a model that you have high confidence in uh, providing accurate predictions for a measurement, um, you know, I think recovery of optical properties or physiological properties within that context, I think, um, is fairly tractable. Um, these optimization algorithms are quite effective, and if you do know the range of properties, you can create these lookup tables. Um, but one thing we don't talk a lot about is that, you know, we kind of assume a priori uh, that, you know, you have an instrument that's configured, especially clinical instruments, you know, to get them approved and you want to reduce cost. You say, okay, we're going to take data at these wavelengths, at these spatial frequencies. But I think what's also an important and a different type of problem, but still an inverse problem in some way is, well, if, say, I don't, I'm not locked down to where I make my measurements, whether it's in time, space, spatial frequency, what have you, is there, uh, is there a framework in which we can create an inverse problem that given this situation, where would be the ideal place in phase space to make our measurement? And that's a different type of problem, but I think it is also an inverse problem because you want to find where in your measurement phase space do you have ideal sensitivity and ideal separability? And could you actually do a set of measurements at fixed places in your phase space, get an estimate of where you are, and then adaptively change your measurement to actually get closer or to get the information you need to resolve your inverse problem more explicitly? Um, I'm just curious if people have what people's reaction to that are or, or whether that might be useful or not useful. So this is something we talk about a lot here is, is measurement design, you know, because often you're designing an instrument and you have an a priori assumption of in what domain your, your characteristics of your system are and you try to find measurement configuration that will work well under all circumstances. But in reality, uh, that's probably not possible. Uh, but can you make a, a crude measurement and then say, oh, okay, I know my, my target is in this subspace, then can I very quickly determine, oh, I should make, you know, measurements at spatial frequency of 0.125 and 0.376, and I know I'm going to get the best I can within this measurement uh, technology to extract well, if you took the derivative of the uh, if, yeah, if you took the derivative of the re measurement reflectance, say, with respect to the say spatial frequency or rho, then that would give you a way to solve that inverse problem, wouldn't it? There's sensitivity and there's also separability. Too, yeah. Right. Right. If there's multiple. Right, but I mean, you could and, use. And, and then if you have a layered system or you have something that has heterogeneity, then well, sure. You know, Right. So, sure, sure. Right. Uh, yeah, I guess complex fast, but it's just a different way mm -hmm. of defining what the derivatives and the sensitivities are with re what parameters you're, you're fixing. And it's not the optical properties, it's the spatial or, or spatial frequency, temporal or temporal frequency. Yes, this is David again. Um, I think you're right. I think derivatives can be taken with respect to any, any of the parameters. So if you're looking at what's the range of parameters, then you can have a variable that represents you know, the range, and you can have a variable that represents the number of parameters. You could see that, you know, in maybe R of rho, that going from, uh, you know, a fixed range, but going from two to three measurements to four gives you a lot of benefit, and the derivative is pretty steep, but maybe after five or six or seven, it, it flattens out. Um, I, I think you're right. It's, you can optimize along that axis, and then you can add in, uh, you know, objective functions that say it's, you know, it's not expensive computationally, but it's expensive uh, in actual dollars and cents to build instruments with, you know, hundreds or thousands of detectors. So you can build in cost functions like that, and you can build in noise functions. Yeah. Um, be really cool to do that. Yeah, it's kind of funny because we solve that inverse problem in a human way, and we don't think anything of it. We just like, okay, let's let's just try these two spatial frames. Oh no, okay, let's try these two things. So, but what if there was an inverse solution that could solve that for you? So just one thought uh, off the top of my head, thinking about the lookup tables there and, you know, the, the surfaces generated, um, I think you can think of them as 
uh, a surface that twists as we change, you know, our, our different spatial frequencies, right? And then you can have as a measure of sensitivity how far or how close those isoclines are, right, for various reflectances and, and everything. So then you can kind of look if we can define how that manifold twists as the spatial frequencies change, then we can have a look at how the sensitivities will change and then what sort of spatial frequencies we want. But that might be really mathematically nasty. That's fine. <laughs> it keeps us in business. Okay. So any, uh, any last questions or comments? Of course, Carol will be here. And David will also be here for lunch. So you can uh, have more time to, to pick their brains. Well, let's thank our speakers.